Amen. do fall on our face and our feet hit the ground, Lord. You have saved us all from your selfishness, from your righteousness, from what you've done. We thank you for that. If there's anybody here today that doesn't understand that, please come to one of us and we will, we will help you understand. Listen to the pastor's words. We're just so thankful for this free space, this free country we have. And we lift everybody up here. Everybody goes through something and Lord, you take care of it all. All we have to do is ask. Thank you so much. We want to touch the sky with you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, New Hope. Woo! You know, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And, and so the picture of that is the fact that, that God desires 
to come and be close to you. When we worship and we give him praise, God's promise is that he's going to respond. And uh, I, I pray you came with a great expectancy for God to speak to you and gather with you and desire to have his being in you because that's the God that we serve. Amen? amen. Well, listen, do me a favor. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, turn around, greet someone, say hello, make a friend, invite somebody out to lunch. If you're in middle school, middle school or high school, they're already exiting the building. Middle school, high school, my right, your left. Just uh, You can just stand right now and head off to your uh, youth classes. There's Anthony in the back. Middle school, high school, just make your way there. It'd be great. Awesome, awesome. You guys are awesome. Well, let me just uh, welcome all our first-time guests <clears throat> and returning guests. And I want our first-time guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. And there isn't any greater mission and any greater cause than for us to be about God's redemptive plan. And uh, I believe he has one for every single one of us in this room, as well as he has one for every single one of our family members, our neighbors, our community, our city, and the whole world. And uh, you and I have this awesome opportunity to participate. Let me just, um, uh, just share just a, a few things of how God is raising up gospel-centered people who are living out this truth in our community. And um, uh, our rooted student ministries, that's our middle and high school ministries, Anthony and, and Keys and their team uh, of... Uh, uh, servant leaders and volunteers have, have decided to come up with what they call a fifth quarter ministry. And if, if you go to Northport High School, every, uh, uh, every quarter, I think, I'm not sure, they have like five or six times where the, the varsity team plays at home and uh, for the, North, the Bobcats, the Northport Bobcats. And usually about a thousand kids come to the game uh, when they play. I mean, they're all over the place. And they have four quarters where they play. Then, at, then at, when the game is over, then you got a thousand kids running and trying to figure out what can they do in the city. Hmm, I don't know about you, but I know my boys were teenagers. I don't know about them running through the city. And uh, so we realized that there was a need that all these kids had nowhere to go, and we didn't want them to get involved in other crazy things. And so we wanted to create a safe, sober environment for them. And so our, our Rooted Youth Ministries partnered with uh, uh, Drug Free Youth, and uh, they come, and Drug Free Youth is a great, great uh, uh, organization, and what they do is they, uh, they provide drug screening for kids who voluntarily will be drug screened. And the reason why a kid would do that is because then they get this ID card, and this ID card gives them um, uh, a free access to the Morgan Center, which I think is about, I don't know, 25 or 30 bucks. I'm not sure what the, the fee is for them, but they don't have to pay that if they're drug free and alcohol free. Also, they partner with businesses and they get discounts at all kinds of restaurants and shops and wherever they go. And so that car becomes very valuable. And, uh, and we also want to reward our children who are intentionally be staying out of the drugs and alcohol. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? That's awesome. And so... This is a great opportunity. They had, this Friday night, uh, they had a great group of teens who came. It's a great outreach. And they, uh, we got, you just go on Facebook, look at all the photos. Just awesome, awesome opportunity, uh, especially for, right now we're focusing on high school students only. 
um, only because of the fact that uh, that's kind of what we're able to handle. And as it grows, we're going to keep on recruiting more volunteers. So if you have a heart for youth, uh, just see Anthony sign up on this wonderful connection card in your weekend program. And we're going to kind of pull that out for a second. We don't mind pulling this weekend program out. If you don't have a weekend program, just kind of raise your hand, and we'll get uh, one of the ushers. If you have the hand one, there's so much stuff going on. I'm not going to mention everything here. All I can do is encourage you to take some time because there might be something here that really tugs at your heart, and uh, God has gifted you and positioned you to be able to use your gifts and talents for the Lord. And um, I can't find my pink connection card. But anyway, there's a pink connection card in here somewhere. <laughs> you wouldn't mind. Who has a pink? There it goes. All right, pink connection card. A bulk of our communication is done online, email, Facebook, website. We just can't get everything in, in printed form as quickly as things are going on here. Uh, one of our largest outreaches that we do uh, for the year, on top of the thousand other ones that we do, is our Thanksgiving Day feeding that we do. Last year we had over 600 people that came uh, on Thanksgiving Day uh, right here and about 100, 125 were deliveries. We have a lot of uh, seniors who are homebound and, and, and they're away from their families, they can't travel and so we go and we deliver a meal and a smile and, uh, and a hug for the grace of God. And let me just challenge the families in the room, if, if you don't have any good, healthy family tradition, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to have a good, healthy family tradition. And a good, healthy family tradition is take, take an hour or two on Thanksgiving Day. I know you've got a lot of plans and family. If you're, if you're in Northport and you're going to have family over, take an hour, take two, take your, you and your, your spouse and your children and serve for an hour. It'll be the most life-transforming thing you'll do. And, and, and allow your children to see you serving God and, and what a blessing it is. That's how you're, going to be, how you're going to raise up children in the ways of the Lord, because they want to see it in your life. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity. There's a table right out here to sign up, and there's a table there to sign up. If We need all kinds of, like, green beans and corn and <clears throat> all kinds of things, and so just sign up. There's information there on the table. I can't encourage you enough to do that. The first important thing I would really do is just take a moment, whether you're a first-time guest, returning guest, and whatever you feel comfortable, name, email, address, that's basically it. A lot of our connection, like I said before, is um, electronic. There's opportunities on this connection card, too, to, to serve, or if you want to get more information, or have someone follow up and call and uh, to talk with, please, please do so. The most important thing on the back of this connection card is what we have prayer requests. And I, I want you to know that our God is alive, He's real, and He answers prayer. And we've seen that over and over. God, prayer requests that God has answered, jobs, families restored, people being healed from cancer. I mean, we believe a God who's real and alive. And so if you need prayer, don't be alone. Fill this thing out. Put it in any one of those offering boxes as, you, as you're kind of coming in and out of the worship center. And uh, every Monday night, your pastors and your leaders here at New Hope, we pray over every single one of these requests. Then after we finish praying, they go to our prayer warriors and intercessors, and they labor over prayer with that as well. I want you to know that uh, we take prayer very seriously here at New Hope. And just quickly about this uh, offering boxes, let me just say that uh, don't feel any obligation at all to give uh, to the offering. And uh, there won't be any plates passed. You can, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, uh, please feel free. Uh, this offering is for those of us who consider New Hope our home. And uh, we see what God is doing and how he's moving forward and we're reaching out to the homeless and widows and orphans and changing car and food pantries and bread giveaways and, and uh, haircuts and clothing and feeding the feeding and feeding and feeding and loving people. I tell you, just amazing. All you got to do is just take five minutes, look at that, and you're going to see all kinds of things. And uh, we just uh, want to say thank you for your generosity because we wouldn't be able to do what God's called us to do without your generosity. I can't thank you enough. All right, where are our little ones? Woohoo! Come on up, guys. What's up, buddy? Huh? Wow. Man. Wow. Good job, buddy. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> cool, 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 cool. 
You know, there's one thing I love about the, practical, the practicality of the Bible. Jesus, Jesus told the disciples, do not hinder the little ones from coming. And this is the reason why we bring the children forward. In response to God's word, we want the children to know that, that this is their home. And uh, we want to create wonderful, creative environments so that there would be no hindrances for our children to be able to learn the gospel and the truths about Jesus. And so um, this, this environment right here, for us as adults, probably doesn't work well for our little ones because they want to jump and run and, and scream and yell, and, and this wouldn't work. Uh, and so uh, you'll see when you came in, there are these four classroom modules right off the parking lot. And uh, we're almost getting close. We've got electric coming in and water going in, and there's information in your weekend program about that. Uh, and we want to create some wonderful spaces, and specifically for our youth. Uh, right now, we have middle school to high school all cramped up in one room. And uh, we're just, we're, we just need the space. And uh, I can't tell you enough and thank you enough for all your generosity and giving uh, to uh, building a brighter future for our youth and our children. And uh, I hope that you see all the work that is being done out there and how every dime is going to create some great spaces for these children and our youth to be able to grow in a solid foundation in Christ and as well as provide them a safe haven where they can come and be able uh, not to get caught up in a lot of the things out there that would do them harm. Amen? So listen, Jesus loved to touch the children and bless them and so symbolically, if you wouldn't mind just extending your hand towards the children, kind of like as Jesus touched them and praying, and we're going to bless them. Father, thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you, Lord, for all our middle and high schoolers that are already meeting. Bless them. Thank you for the parents who brought these children. Thank you, Lord God, Father, for all the servant volunteers and teachers and workers that prepared lessons all week long to invest in our children and our youth, that they may know the truths of God and that they may follow him all the rest of their life. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, guys. You're a first-time guest and you want to see the classrooms where your children are going to? Please feel free. Well, before we go any further, let's pause and invite the Holy Spirit to come to teach us what he would want us to learn through the ancient truths of the Bible. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we gather here because, Lord, of the desperate times that we're all in. And, Father, there's uh, wars and hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes and there is so much pain and suffering in the world that we live in. And Father, we know, Lord, that our world is filled with fear. And so we come and we gather and we ask you, Lord, help us so that we do not become full of fear in our own hearts as well. Because that's why so many people have fear that hinders them from having that urgency to look to the good news of Jesus. And so we gather here, and I ask, Lord, 
give us, empower us to live boldly for you during these troubled times. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I believe that God has a story to tell you and me today. That God has a picture to paint for you and me today. A word of encouragement for you and me today. A memory of himself that he wants to burn into our hearts and in our minds today so that you and I may become fearless in the midst of such tragedy and brokenness and suffering in the world that you and I live in. Pray that you would begin to have a great hope. And I believe that because God wants to show you and me His grace and the power to overcome using the life of the Apostle Paul as a witness of how God is able to do the same in each and every one of us here today who believe. And so as we're going to examine today's scriptures, let us explore the Apostle Paul's fearlessness by being gospel transformed by a testimony of courage. Well, what does that mean exactly? How is that possible? Because like the heroes in the Bible, an encounter with Jesus gives us power to overcome. You're going to see in the scriptures that every time we see a biblical hero in the Bible, they had an encounter with God, and that God was able to allow them to become victorious overcomers in the situation and the scenario that they lived in. And I believe that this is best understood when you and I consider how God's love awakens us to God's reality and how God's truth keeps us on the right path and how Jesus sustains us to finish this life well. So how is that all possible? I want to suggest to you today that the gospel is what frees us from self-absorption so that you and I can then live courageously for him. And there probably isn't any better passage in scripture that we're going to see this played out as we're continuing our study through the book of Acts We've called this series called Transformed. And here as we go to Acts 22 as we're continuing our study. So if you wouldn't mind, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 22 or pull out your cell phone, your iPad. Your <laughs> we'll have the, screen, the verses on the screen as well. Now I'm going to give you a little backdrop, but let's just read the, the passage here. Acts chapter 22 and we'll start with verse 1. And it says... Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born of Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city under Gamelia, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our father and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way, this way meaning us as Christians, that's what they called them back in the first century, followers of the way, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As also the high priests and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, I came near Damascus. Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied, my companion saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do? I asked. 
Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to so all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are, you stand, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, and call on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. All right, let's pause right there. Let me give you a little backdrop here. In chapter... 21, Paul has, on this journey, heading towards Jerusalem, as we talked about last week in chapter 21, everybody, all, he's getting all this great advice, don't go, don't go, you know, it's, there's a lot of trouble there, and there's a lot of pain and suffering and, and all kind of thing, but, but Paul's on a mission, and for the last couple of years, he's been raising money for the Jerusalem church. Because there's a great famine going on now in Jerusalem. And people are suffering and dying. And the Christian believers, the Jewish Christian believers that are there are suffering even worse. Because they have no political, social, or economic influence at all. They're under tremendous amount of persecution from Rome. And as well as from their own Jewish brethren. And to help them, even for their own brethren to help them, could put the people helping them at risk. And so Paul who has this great love for his people and the great love for Israel, is putting himself into harm's way to bring this offering to, to relieve the suffering of what's going on. And he is determined to bring that offering to the Jewish people. And I believe there's a twofold thing that we talked about again last week, was ultimately that he wanted, he wanted the Jewish believers in Jerusalem to see how the Gentile church Though they might be different, though they might look different and eat different and dress differently, but that they love them too. That this is one house regardless of the differences. That our unity is based on who our God is, not based on our clothing or the color of our skin or how much money we have or don't have or how educated or uneducated we are. And to practically show them what faith looks like. Faith, if a people of faith are moved to action... Not just to sit, soak, and sour in seats. But that you are called by the living God to move and to have a, He wants to have His being in us so that we would be the light, His light, into the midst of people's darkness. That we would be a city on a hill. We would be the head and not the tail. And you and I have this great calling and this great purpose and that your life has extraordinary meaning regardless of what the Lord, or regardless of what the world would tell you and me. That we're just a cosmic accident. That our, our ancestors were chimps. And that you and I have really no purpose in this life other than to uh, accumulate, consume, and then ultimately die and get as much as you can before you die. If that is all life is all about, then I would tell you this life is just a sick joke. Because who would want to go through all the pain, all the suffering, and all the hurt? So here's Paul, and he's showing them that there is a greater hope than what this world could possibly give, and he brings this offering. And now he gets there and gives it to the people in chapter 21, the end of chapter 21. Now he, he gives it to the, the, the church, and they're telling him, don't go to the temple because they're going to kill you, Paul. Okay, they... 
The word's out. They, every, all the, your Jewish brethren believe that you have turned your back on Jerusalem. You've turned your back on your traditions and, 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 and the teachings of Moses. You, you are now contrary to the, to the law of Moses, and they're, they're ready to, 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 to kill you. Don't go. And Paul is determined to show these people, even if it puts them in harm's way, and which has been a pattern in his life as he goes from city to city, and he, there's this, this ritual that's going on, this Nazarene ritual that's going on now, uh, this ceremony. And he goes with a group of other Jewish people who are following the Mosaic laws, and he's going there to do this Nazarene ritual of cleansing and washing and, 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 and following all that. And he's going to the temple to prove to his, to prove to, to his people that I have not turned my back on the law. I want you to see the promise of God's law. You're only seeing it halfway. And so he goes, and while he's there, these Judaizers are there, and they recognize him. And here at the end of 21, they, 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 they venomously accuse him of violating the law of Moses, and so the whole temple, the, the whole mob comes, and they start beating him. And the only thing that I could ever give a picture of that is I remember when I, when I uh, uh, before I retired from the NYPD, um, New York City had about three or four riots. Los Angeles had a couple of riots during that time in the 80s and 90s. And the one I, I don't remember ever, ever men, remember, uh, um, was it Rodney King? Remember Rodney King? And they, just imagine a mob beating you. Now, I want you to just think of that about 10 times more. He's getting beat. He's, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to be dead. At the same time, I just want you to see the hand of God, because God, if God can use a donkey, he could definitely use me, right? All right? God now uses a Roman centurion with a whole cohort of troops, and they see this massive commotion going on in, in the temple, and the centurion goes, and he rescues. He doesn't know. He just figures that this guy is probably some bad guy. I mean, who, I mean, of course he's bad because the people are beating him. I mean, of course he's guilty, right? He's automatically guilty. But they bring him out because they're going to arrest him and eventually crucify him or whatever they're going to do. And they pull him out, and he's on this now. He, they, they take him up the stairs of, of this colonnade that's in the temple, as the scripture says. And he's probably all beat up and bruised and bloodied. And, and amazingly, he turns, the scripture says in the end of 21, that he turns to the centurion and speaks to him in Greek. And the centurion is taken back going, whoa, whoa you're, why are you speaking to me in, in, in such an educated, sophisticated language? I mean, aren't you some like terrorist or some... You know, like, like rabble rouser, an uneducated buffoon. And then for a moment, the centurion now is pausing because he's realizing I might, have, I might have come to some wrong conclusions. And at that same time, Paul asked him, can, can you give me a moment to address my fellow brethren here? And amazingly, he does. Now, this is why I think it's important. Now, Paul then goes and gives a discourse about his testimony and what God has done in the past and all these. And he's probably done this about three or four times already. And so I'm not going to hit that point. We've discussed that probably more times already during the series. I want us to really kind of see the backdrop here. And the backdrop here, which I think is just absolutely supernatural, is how Paul responds. I mean, think about this. How... How many people here have lived a, just a, you know, just an awesome, perfect life? You've never experienced any pain or suffering. I mean, everything always just works out for you. I mean, you just, it's just wonderful. Just raise your hand. Everybody wants to see. Heathens. We're all heathens. No, well, life doesn't work out, isn't that? You don't have to take, let's take religion out of it, okay? You, you and I know we live in a world full of pain and suffering and injustice. And no one is excluded from that. No one is, lives a life, regardless of what you believe or don't believe, or excluded from that. We all experience pain and suffering. And I want you to see, here's Paul, and he's being beaten up. 
and the people that are beating him up, somehow, and I, can't, I just can't imagine how he's able to do that. I mean, I know that if I was in like a little uh, a car accident or maybe a little fender bender at Walmart, you know, and, and uh, you end up tapping a car and, then, and you're in the car and after, after you're shaking, right? I mean, in your mind's like, oh, my God, and you got 15,000 things running in, in, in your head. You know, i got to call the insurance. Oh, my God, i got to tell my spouse. i got to tell, oh, my kid's okay and, and whatever. Paul is being beat up by a mob, and he has the composure and the ability to rise above the midst of the pain and the suffering and all the injustice that's doing it because he knows what they're doing is wrong. And he has the clarity of thought in the midst of the storm of life that he's in, to turn around to the centurion and tell them, oh, in Greek no less, he wins, he wins the centurion, then he's able now to turn to the crowd that was just beating him and then speak in another language, in Aramaic to him. And my mind goes, how is he able to do that? How can you and I in the midst of pain and suffering and sickness, in the midst of you getting laid off this week and looking at it and going, oh my God, I'm not going to have a job. I can't support my... Your finances falling apart. The, the bank repossessing your house. The possibility of your relationship with your spouse on the brink and falling apart and your family just being ripped apart. Or possibly getting that phone call from that doctor and giving that terrible news that you have a terminal illness. How in the world can you and I be able, like a Paul in the midst of such tragedy and such pain, to be able to stand with such composure and confidence that in the midst of this storm, I'm in the eye of it. I believe there's three things here, and there's many, many more, and I can't encourage you enough this week to spend some time in Acts 21, 22 and, and, and allow God to speak to you this week. I'm just going to give you three, just to kind of whet your appetite, Three principles that I believe that Paul clearly had that I believe for us today that we, you and I can have today. And when we think of the practicality of, of, of living this out, probably the most important thing that you and I can do in it as people of faith is that in the, midst of the, in the midst of the world full of fear and full of chaos and full of injustice, you and I can be a solid rock that you and I could actually be a, a beacon of hope and encouragement to those who are crumbling and falling apart around us. I mean, what a gift. So, um, Acts 22, look at verse... The first, first principle I want us to look at is... Um, in the verse 3, it says, Under Gamilia, I was thoroughly trained in the law. And I want us to focus. I want you to just kind of like circle that word... Uh, was, because he's looking at the past, and I want you to see that Paul was able to overcome. Paul was not only to o overcome in this, in this scenario, but he was able to experience great victory in God. So how, how are you and I able to have this great victory? How are you and I able, like, a, like the Apostle Paul, to be fearless, to live boldly in the midst of these troubling times? And I want to suggest to you that it begins because victory comes by looking back at what God has already done. And I want you to just kind of capture this for a moment, that Paul was in such a place that he knew that his God, what God had already done, that the God that you and I serve is, is extraordinary. I mean, he looks back and he sees the God who's able to heal every sickness. He's able to look back and see that, that the God, his God is able to speak to a storm and quiet it. He sees that his God is able, that in the midst of, 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 of this terrible storm going on, he can walk on water. He can raise the dead. He can make dry bones live. And he goes back and he remembers it. He sees the was. He was thoroughly trained in the law. Trained in what? Knowing what God has already done. And somehow, when he looked back, he saw the fact that if God could do that then, somehow, 
I believe that my God is able to do that for me today. And there's, there's a certain sense of assurance. In the midst of all the brokenness and mess that you and I go through in life, the pain and the suffering, the disappointment, disillusionment, that one of the greatest source of courage that you and I can have is just simply remembering what God has already done. And I believe that that kind of breaks out in some practical ways for us because what I believe that ends up doing is that when you and I are able to look at what God has already done, then we're not focused on me, myself, and I. And this is where fear grips us. This is where you and I, when we start just feeling all the anxiety and all the fear and all the worry, and, 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 and it, usually what it does, it paralyzes you and me. And we can't move forward because we're focusing on ourselves. And the reality is, let me just tell you something, you know, the reality is that all the worrying and all the, the concern you have and you're just sitting there, you know, going, oh, thinking of all the possible what ifs is absolutely a waste of your time and energy. Because you have no power, no energy, nothing to change it. And it's a waste of energy, but the problem is that our hearts are so full of fear. And it doesn't matter whether you're a believer in God or not a believer in God, we're all human beings and we're all affected by the same thing. The choice that comes to us today is where will you and I gain our courage and our strength from? Paul, you he can see, is clearly drawing his strength and his courage from the God who saved him. And he shares that in his story over and over. And I want you to see, that. well, how, how does that happen? And I, this is something, as, as Paul begins to share the story of the gospel and how he was blinded and he couldn't see, and it really was a real picture of his spirituality. He was blinded spiritually. And he shows up and he, and he talks to these people about the risen, resurrected Jesus. Because when he tells them that I saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, he says, this is me, Jesus of Nazareth. That means that he, he saw him dead. He saw, yeah, everybody in Jerusalem at that time knew that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. Now God is speaking to him. Jesus is speaking to him. So he's, he's a risen. He's risen in fulfillment of the law, fulfillment of Scripture. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisee. They believed in the resurrection and the Messiah to come. He knew that was a fulfillment of all of what God had already promised to do in the past. And see, this is what the gospel does to you and me, as it did to Paul and it did to every apostle and every disciple for the last 2,000 years. You see, you and I, our biggest struggle when we go through times is our own ego, our own ego. Um... We tend to try to draw courage from what the world says. Let me put it this way. When you and I are going through pain and suffering and sorrow, the world is going to tell you, society, culture, family, whatever paradigm it is, something in this life is going to tell you, just suck it up. Pick yourself up by your bootstrap. Get, just get over it. Get over it. Find your inner self, your inner self somewhere. Tap into something that's in there. Find nirvana and exist. And somehow you're going to be able to do that. Now, I don't know about you, over the last 50 years, I have never seen that work. I have never seen going to someone who's just lost a family member or a spouse or a child and go to them, well, listen, just find some inner strength and, you know, suck it up. Don't worry about it. Pick yourself up. Keep on going. Ah, really? Someone who just got the worst news in the world, you know what I mean? They're, 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 their children hate them, their spouse has run off, they've lost their job, their bank is coming, ah, oh, don't worry about it, just fine, just boost up your own ego, just tell yourself, don't worry, you can handle it, you're going to work it out. And just keep on telling yourself that you're going to make it. I've never seen that work. Maybe you've seen that work. I've never seen that work. And basically, the, wor the, the world is telling you to me, go to our superiority ego and boost it up and drive out all fear. Just boost up your ego, boost up your soul and self-esteem, fill it up with all just words, whatever, and you'll just kind of get over it. I mean, what I call cycle babble, all right? That ain't, that's, I've never seen that work. See, the gospel comes along, and 
and does the complete opposite to our superiority ego. It basically says to you and me, you have no power and no ability to rescue yourself. That you are so flawed and so broken and so rebellious and so... And, and it drags our superior ego all the way down to the point where it feels like it's just going to die. But then at the same time, this is just the, the unbelievable awesomeness of, superior, of, of the gospel. It takes our inferiority ego, because if you're a human being, just read a book, you'll see. Okay, we all have a superiority ego, we all have a... Infer some have it more than others, right? <laughs> and you know those, right? <laughs> some are so full, they can't, their heads can't fill the room. You know? And then you've got some who are just so down on themselves. That's that inferiority. They've been told their whole lives that they're nothing, they're worthless, you're just a bum, you'll never amount to anything. Some of us have even had parents and family tell us such things. You're no good. And so God, the gospel, the truth of the gospel is that you and I need a savior because we have no power, no ability in of ourselves to rescue ourselves, to save ourselves from the dilemma that we're in. And it drives our superiority ego all to the bottom. And then at the same time, it raises up our inferior, inferiority ego up to the greatest heights of heaven and says that you are loved by your heavenly father and that he fearfully and wonderfully made you and that he put his, his immortal stamp, and you are made in his image, and he rejoices over you with singing, that you are the apple of his eye, that he puts a banner of love over you. And all of a sudden now you're raised to these great heights, but now you're at a place of humility and realizing that my self-worth and my self-esteem is not based on my bank account. It's not based on what people say about me. It's not about how big of a house I have, how, how much education. If I live on the right street, if I have the right clothes, if I'm from the right culture. Because that superiority ego has been driven right to the ground where it needs to be. And you and I become the most humblest people on the planet, realizing that we have a God who loves us and cares for us and saves us and redeems us. And that, my friends, is what I believe sets you and me free. Free from the pressure of trying to earn somebody's love. I mean, think how ridiculous that is. If my sons ever come to me and go, Dad, I you know, I, I just wanted you to know that, that I cleaned the car because I just, want, I just wanted you to love me today. And, and I know if I do these three things, then you'll love me more. I'd be broken as a dad. Son, that you think that there's something you could do? I said, I have poured my affections on you since you came out of your mother's womb. And there isn't a thing that you did at that time because you were ugly. I mean, their heads are squished. You know what I mean? I mean, they, it's just, I'm sorry for you mothers out there, but it's just, it's, a, uh, woo, it's terrible. But I, and I've loved you ever since. There isn't anything you could possibly have done. And there wasn't anything you've done. I loved you now when you were born, and now that you're 24, going to be 25. Doesn't mean that I appreciate everything that they've done, <laughs> Right? but my love for them. I want you to see that, that, that he doesn't have to do anything. That's why they come and they sit on my sofa and they take my stuff and they go in my refrigerator because they know I'm going to love them regardless, right? <laughs> they have, no, they have no, no concern about calling, Dad, can you give me money? Uh, really? Praise the Lord. Your heavenly Father wants you to come to him in the same manner. And the gospel does that. And the gospel, and here... Here, Paul, out of his great love for his people, I believe this is one of the reasons why he is, he is anchored. And he has, he's able to overcome because he doesn't need their approval. He just loves them, even when, even when they're doing him wrong. I want you to see what the gospel does. See, it it's absolutely takes no effort for you and to me to love somebody who loves us back. No effort. Okay, that... I mean, cats and dogs do that. But see, the gospel 
tells you and me to love people who don't love you back. That takes great faith. That takes a life that is so filled by the Spirit of God, so confident in who my Heavenly Father says about who I am, that I'm not concerned about what other people think of me and what they say about me. I'm not concerned about having the right house and the right wife and the right building and the right whatever. None of that matters. I'm on a mission for God. And there's nothing in this life that will satisfy my soul but Him. The gospel does a tremendous, deep, penetrating work. And I want you to kind of see a little bit here about this courage I believe that Paul had. See, the world tells us that we have to basically fight against fear. You've got to drive out all fear. We label, if you drive out all fear, that that's courage. I, I want to say that's a bad definition. And I think maybe, maybe part of it is that we have a bad definition of what true courage is. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing when we're afraid. That's courage. I would even say that for you and me to try to drive out fear from our lives, whatever that would look like, beat yourself, this and that, you know, and try to boost up your ego so that your ego is so inflated there's no room for fear. That's a terrible place to be. You're overconfident and self-centered. That's a path for deep failure. But ultimately, that you and I see that in the midst of the fact that, yes, we are afraid. And God, if you and I don't have a healthy amount of reverence and fear in our own lives, we won't be able to know right and wrong. We won't be able to do the right thing. You and I will never be courageous. It's not possible. Jump down to verse 10 here. First thing, so he looks away, which I think this is a great thing for you, what God has already done. He looks away from himself, looks at what God has already done, and then here he goes, what shall I do, Lord? And I believe that right now here, boy, Paul goes, victory comes by looking now at what God is going to do. So if he saw what God already done, and that's building confidence. And what we see here is that when he says, what shall I do, is that God is speaking to him. And because God is speaking to him, our God is not just the God of the past. This isn't just a book of, ooh, look what God did in the past. If that's all you and I had, it would not be enough. Our God is not only the God of the past, he's also the God of now. He's also the God who speaks to you and to me right now. How? In his word? He's already speaking to you and me in his word. He's speaking to you and me in prayer. As we pray and say, okay, Lord, should I go right? Should I go left? What should I do? Should I buy this house? Should I not buy this house? Should I marry this person? Should I not marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I not take it? Should I move out of the state? Should I stay in the state? You know, whatever. It's amazing. When you and I are in his word and in prayer, how God speaks and inspires you to make wise choices. The truth of God keeps you on the right path. Let me just say that not only in prayer and the word, but probably, probably one of the biggest resources that God's given us that we never tap into is the other believers around you. You know that God uses his people to speak into your life? Some of the greatest encouragements I've had are some, some great men of God who have spoken into my life and told me, Eddie, stop that. That's stupid, you know? Like, get over that, you know, whatever. And sometimes you just need someone to speak into your life and say, yeah, that's great. What you're doing right there, that's awesome. Keep that up. Or someone to come and say, listen, stop that, okay? Don't talk to your spouse that way. Don't talk to your children that way. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. And someone's just going to be there and speak into your life. And I believe God uses those people speak into your life. And so he is the God of now. And so here, Paul, he shares his testimony. He says, God spoke to him and he knew. And so he is sure of his salvation. He is sure of what God's purpose him to do. And so he has great, he gains great ability to overcome and experience a victory in the midst of such pain and suffering and tragedy that we all go through. 
And he is able to see that. I think that's just amazing. I think that um, Paul's courage flows out of his absolute desire to see God lifted up. And that gives him a great hope. You and I, in the midst of all the pain and suffering, tragedy we go through, we gain our courage through a great hope. He looks back, sees what God has done. He looks now as God is speaking to him, and he gains a great hope. Not only that, but I want you to see something that's, I think, just remarkable. Because the God of now, the God who speaks to you, the God who inhabits the praises of his people, desires to hang out with you. And I think, who am I? Who am I that the God of the universe, our creator God, our heavenly father, wants to hang out with a little Eddie from Brooklyn? <laughs> I'm a nobody. And the God of the universe wants to spend time with me. And you know what that communicates to me? He loves me. And so hope Hope is what raises me up to stand and overcome. I have a great hope that God's in control of my outcomes. Not this person, not that organization, not if the, if, if the economy stays where it is, and my 401k lasts. That's, that's not where my hope is in. All those things will fall apart. My hope is in him. And then what gives me ability to overcome and and to stand victorious is the fact that God speaks to me and God cares for me. And God has, as it says here that uh, in verse 10, he says, he's assigned Paul these things to do. That God has an absolute purpose and a destiny for every single one of us. That is amazing. And that when I remember God's love, I have a great sense of self-worth and confidence even though everybody else might be against me. That is how you and I will be able to stand in the midst of storms. I love the last part here in verse 21. He says, Then the Lord said to me, Go. Go. Paul looks back, sees what God has already done. Paul looks at the now of what God is already doing and speaking to your life. And then I think this is probably the icing on the cake. Paul goes and he looks and he sees this great hope and this future victory in the resurrection. Jesus is alive. He's alive, he's real, and he's concerned about the details of your life and my life. There isn't any mob. There isn't any economic crash. There isn't any sense of, oh, oh, man, if you just knew what I did in my past. God, none of those things. Our future is not in our past. Our future is in him. And when you and I have him, everything else all of a sudden doesn't matter. Let me, let me, let me see if I can put this in some practical terms for us. And I've, I've mentioned this a few times, but I tell you, it's probably the... I have... When I talk about this future thing, why is it so powerful for me? And let, me let me just for a second, let's just take religion out of this for a second. Let's just put on our brains that God gave us is a good thing. And just think about this practically. You don't have to have faith to believe what I'm going to tell you. That you and I are going to spend all of our days, from the minute we're five or six years old, we go into kindergarten, we go through 12 years of schooling so that we can prepare ourselves one day you know, to be part of society, get a job, stay out of our parents' basement playing video games. And then we end up going to college because we want a career. And, you know, flipping burgers is nice, but you can't, you can barely feed yourself. You want to one day not only take care of yourself, but one day a family. And so you go to college, you can get, a, you get an education, so you can get a career job. You can not only take care of yourself, you can take care of your family, children. Some of us go get a four-year degree, and so we spend 12 years in school, another four-year, that's 16 years. Then we end up, some of us who want to advance in that career, we go get another two, three years, get a batch, uh, master's degree. 
We put ourselves in the $150,000 worth of debt and education and labs and books and all that kind of stuff so that you and I could possibly work a job for another 20, 30 more years and then retire at the end of our life. And we've, a, and we've amassed all kinds of houses and toys and cars and boats and motorcycles and all kinds of things. And we got 401k and all that. And this is what I've experienced in the 100 plus hospital visits. I can't, I can't even count how many I've gone to. Where I've gone to the hospital where someone's at the end of their life and days. And here that person goes to me, oh, pastor, please, could you do me a favor? Can you go home to my house and pull up my bank statement? I want to copy, I want to hold on to my bank statement before I go. Oh, could you go, you know, I got this plaque from this, I worked 30, 40 years and they gave me a nice plaque and a watch. Could you bring the watch to me? I want to hold on to my watch right before I go. Could you go home and take a little piece of that granite countertop? I want to rub it one more time before I go. Never. You and I came into this world naked. We're going to leave this world naked. And there is nothing you and I, you don't have to have faith to believe that. Okay? Let me give you a statistic. In the United States, all 50 states, the mortality rate in America is 100%. Just a clue. Just a clue. The choice, my friends. Now, this is where faith does come in. Where will you find and draw your courage from? Your granite countertops, your 401k, your house, your car, the fact that you're fun at parties. Is that going to sustain you at the end? Is that going to sustain you? You can amass a million dollars in your 401k. You could have a $2 million beach house and multiple homes and cars and such and such. Can I give you another clue? There are no U-Hauls behind that hearse. Everything you have sweated and bled for, those little heathenistic children of yours are going to sell it all on eBay. For nothing. Pennies on a dollar. And they're going to squander everything that you've worked your whole life for. And I, that's okay. But if your hope, if you're drawing your courage and your strength from all that stuff, and if at the end of your life, that's the only thing you built your life on is anything in this life, I'm telling you, it's a scary death. Because I know that you're going to go, is that all there is? But see, if you give your life to Jesus, if you base your life on him, if you remember what God has already done, what God is doing now, and if you remember your future hope, it doesn't matter, then all the stuff that you and I have, they're just us stewarding these things to be able to impact people's lives for the kingdom of God. Then you use the resources God's given you as a tool to say, "My in faith, Lord, I am radically going to be generous. I am radically going to give everything away because I can't take it with me anyway. So the question is, where will you draw your courage from? Will you choose the world's courage, people, places, and things? Or will you choose God's courage that gives you a greater hope and a greater love and a promise that he's not going to compensate you for this life. All the other religions on the planet, I challenge you, I, all the other religions on the, on the planet promise you that he's going to compensate you. What, you know, 60-something virgins, you know what I mean, Ivana, you know, you're going to enlighten man. He's going to compensate you for all the pain, all the suffering, all the sickness, and some moral code that you to hold up to. And hopefully, if you're good enough, if you able to muster it up inside of you enough that you'll eventually earn it somehow. The gospel is the only, Christianity is the only one that you and I have the promise. God does not promise compensation. He promises restoration. He is going to restore all things. Because I know that if you and I live long enough in this life, everything that we hold dear will be stripped away. 
every person you and I have ever loved in this life, if we live long enough, will be gone. And that's why we can't put our hopes and dreams here. All it leaves us is misery and pain and disillusionment and hurt. You see? The gospel is the only hope. And so when my... If I live, old, if I live long enough to 120 and my family's gone and my children and everyone has passed along and I'm still lingering in this life, praying for death, you know, to come... Like Paul said, I'd rather be with the Lord, but I, while I'm here, i got a purpose. See, in hope in God, I'm moving towards everything I love because it's never to say goodbye, but to say see you later. If I have no faith and have no hope and this life is all I have, I don't believe, then the closer, the older I get, the further away I'm moving from the things I love. pray you, like Paul, you gain a great power to overcome and have victory. Let's all stand. I want us to, I know I've given you a fire hose of stuff to think about, but I pray that you will see that our Heavenly Father has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for you for victory. It is why it's so important for you and me to trust in Jesus. It's why you and I obediently get water baptized. That's what they told Paul to do. Go and be baptized. Realize that ultimately that the greatest, one of the greatest gifts outside of the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given the body of Christ is other believers in our midst. And that's why I gather in home groups and small groups. It's very hard to connect in rows. You have to be able to connect in circles. That is how you're able to allow God to use other people to speak into your life. It's hard to get speaking in the back of your head, right? I'm going to close with this song. Until all, until the whole earth hears, a song by Casting Crowns. I don't know no better way than to worship God as we close and to say, okay, Lord, if you have not made a decision to follow Jesus, this is the moment. It's between you and God, not between you and me or the church or anybody else. Scripture makes clear it's you and him. On that road to Damascus, you and him. Nobody else can see, nobody else can hear. It's not important. What's important is for you. And if you've made the decision of faith and never been water baptized, I can't encourage you enough. Just write it down on the connection card, put it in the offering box, and we'll get back to you. It'll be awesome. Matter of fact, I think there's a teenager today who's going to get baptized by the grace of God. It's been awesome. So let's close with this song, and then I'll come back and close in prayer.
Father, I thank you, Lord, Father, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that you have provided power from heaven so that we can be victorious overcomers in this life. In the midst of tragedy and pain and injustice and suffering, Lord, we can be a people of compassion and mercy, that we can be a people of radical generosity, Lord, that loves people into the kingdom of God, that serves our city and beyond. That faith moves us, Lord, to be an answer to the world's problem, not a critic of it. I pray, Father, that you would continue to raise up this community of faith called New Hope here as we are your hands and feet into a world that is desperate for you, that we can be the light in the midst of people's darkness, your light, Lord. And, Father, that you have called us out of darkness and you have given us a wonderful purpose and a plan and a destiny even while we were in our mother's womb you have planned it out and we know Lord that you're going to produce the outcome and we trust you in that I pray Father that you would continue to have your way in us and use us as we love this city with, our, with the homeless ministry with the food pantry with our bread and pastry giveaway every week Lord, Father, with this Thanksgiving, Lord, we pray, Father, for a harvest. We pray, Father, that you would raise up a generation, Lord, that's going to hunger and pant after you. And we will not be satisfied to the whole world hears. In your name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful and awesome day.